With a show of hands, I'd like y'all to answer the question, of which of the lines on the right is the closest to the standard line? How many of y'all believe it's line A? Line B? And line C? So it's pretty obvious that the correct answer is line B. Well, in the 1950s, a psychologist named Solomon Ask once performed this experiment in a much more private setting. It begins with him showing the test subjects in a group of three this picture. He begins by asking the test subjects a very simple question regarding this picture, in fact, the exact same one that I just asked you. However, two of the three people in the group were instructed to say the wrong answers as they were actors. In the end, the majority of the true test subjects conformed to this idea that line A or line C was the correct answer, even when given the physical proof that they were wrong. Why didn't the test subjects say anything? They were obviously right, they had the proof right in front of them, they were standing there staring at the exact same picture that you and I are looking at right now, and yet they conformed. They accepted the wrong ideas right because they wanted to conform to everyone else around them and fit within the molds of normality. As experiments are not solely applicable to the lengths of different lines, but rather his discoveries find relevance in our daily lives. Because sometimes we can accept the wrong answers as right. Sometimes we can blur both moral and ethical obligations. So today, I'd like to talk to you about how we have become desensitized to some of the wrong answers in our lives. Maybe it's a desensitization to violence because we've seen so much of it. Maybe it's a desensitization to premarital and casual sex. Maybe it's a desensitization to drugs. Or maybe it's a desensitization to something that we don't consider so serious. Maybe it's a desensitization to something like profanity. Already, I've been able to sneak the word desensitization in. By dictionary definition, when we are desensitized, we are insensitive or non-reactive to a sensitizing subject. But by my definition, when we are desensitized, we're blind to how negatively things can impact us. Because when we see something, taste something, smell something, or do something enough times, it's not so bad anymore. When we see so many acts of violence and in video games and in movies, violence in the real world is not so bad anymore. When it becomes tempting to watch pornography on our phones or see sexual scenes online, Premarital sex is not such a big deal. When we try drugs just once or see our friends with some pot, drugs become less taboo and less harmful. And when we hear a few cuss words and say a few cuss words and say a few more, profanity is not so bad anymore. We become desensitized. And when we are desensitized, our society's conception of what normal is begins to shift. As a child growing up, there are a lot of different ideals being promoted. What I heard on TV was a lot different from what I heard on the radio. What I heard on the radio was a lot different from what my parents were telling me to do. What I saw my peers doing, that was a lot different from what I learned in school. So you can imagine how difficult this was to create my own morals and shape my own morality, and how difficult it was to decide what was wrong and what was right because I had an angel and a devil on both of my shoulders, and I wasn't always sure which one to listen to. This allowed for a lot of desensitization to occur because I became really blind to the negative effects of a lot of societal norms. I heard a lot of talk about sex. I heard a lot of talk about drugs. I heard a lot of profane words. And as a kid, I concluded that all of this was normal. I didn't have a desire to participate in these activities, but I didn't think they were wrong either. They were okay, acceptable, normal. I became desensitized as many youths grow up to be. But when I entered into middle school, something in me didn't want to be normal anymore. I had realized that for the longest time I was fitting in with what society was telling me to say and with what society was telling me to do and who society wanted me to be because it was way easier that way. But I began to question everything. Was I wearing the latest outfits to fit within the newest trends or was I a trendsetter? Because I didn't want to be a follower, I wanted to be a leader. I didn't want to be a conformer, I wanted to be a transformer. I wanted to make my own normal, a new normal. So this made me take steps towards getting resensitized to a lot of things that I would accepted as okay. To do this, for the past six years of my life, I put on what I like to call tunnel vision glasses. And tunnel vision is interesting because it's often thought of as a sight defect. But really, it's a temporary benefit. Because when you have tunnel vision, you only focus on one thing and one goal. You don't pay attention to anything else that's going around you or what anyone else is doing, but rather you play your own game with the eye on the ball. To get resensitized to a lot of societal norms growing up, I would often find myself wearing these tunnel vision glasses. At a young age, I decided after being influenced by a lot of important people in my life and rooted in my own faith that I didn't want to have sex until marriage, I didn't want to do drugs, and I didn't want to be profane in the words that I spoke. Because these societal norms differed a lot from the goals that I had just described, I had to focus really hard on them. 
I knew that if I took my tunnel vision glasses off just for a second and I paid attention to what television shows were promoting, to what some pop music was saying, and to what my peers were doing, I would get distracted and I would change my morals accordingly. And I didn't want the world to influence me, but rather I wanted my way of life to influence the world. And this worked for a really long time. I pretended what I thought was bad didn't exist. And I was really happy because my world was full of rainbows and gumdrops. But at some point, these tunnel vision glasses shattered. I went to high school, and I couldn't pretend anymore that people weren't doing drugs, or that people weren't having sex, or that people weren't cussing. Reality hit, because before I was living in a bubble of innocence and sometimes ignorance, which was a really good thing to grow up with because I stayed rooted in my morals, but it was also a bad thing because I was lying to myself. So the next thing that I did to get resensitized to a lot of societal norms was be honest with myself. By being honest, I was able to objectively confirm whether or not I believed what society was telling me. Because on one hand, society was telling me that premarital sex was okay and acceptable. But I was seeing a lot of my friends endure pregnancies and abortions and STDs and depression because of it. Society was telling me that drugs were fun and okay and normal. But I was seeing a celebrity on the news every other day die from a drug overdose. So society was telling me that profanity was harmless and meaningless but I was seeing a lot of my friends get hurt by mean words and slurs. I didn't block out these occurrences, but instead I listened and I observed. And I concluded that the harms of these societal norms were not worth fitting in for, for me. I encourage you to be honest with yourself. I encourage you to listen to what society is telling you. And I encourage you to observe the real world effects and ask yourself whether or not these two ideals line up. But just because I was honest with myself, that didn't mean that society stopped being society. That didn't mean that everything around me disappeared, but instead, it heightened. And living life as an outlier and as one of the few who chose line B when everyone else around me chose line A and line C, that was a marathon and not a sprint. And sometimes, it feels like I'm in first place, and it's really easy to run my own race because it's only me and the finish line. But other times, others are catching up, and I get distracted. I see how happy my friends are to be excelling in their own decisions. I see how happy my friends are to be excelling in their own choices in a relationship and having casual sex. I see how happy my friends are to go to parties and do drugs. I see how happy my friends are to be able to express themselves with profane words. And sometimes, in this marathon of a decision, I move into last place. Everyone else has left me. Everyone else is excelling in their own decisions. And the way that I combat these thoughts and these questions and these doubts of whether or not I'm making the right choice and the right decision is the reassurance of the finish line. Because it doesn't matter how fast I go or what anyone else is doing around me, all that matters is that I finish my race, I told myself. Finishing my race is abstaining from sex. Finishing my race is abstaining from drugs. Finishing my race is abstaining from profanity. And the truth is, we all have a race to finish, a long one at that. And we all have the choice of whether or not we want to run this race with hurdles or without. And if we run this race without hurdles, we need to run our race without all hurdles. If your finish line is to abstain from premarital sex, run without the hurdle of tempting yourself. For me, because this is one of my goals, it's really important that I don't unnecessarily draw attention to myself or draw guys in. It's really important that I'm modest in both my dress and in my actions so I don't tempt my own self. It's really important that I don't watch pornography or sexual scenes for my own sake of not tempting myself. It's really important that I involve myself with someone who has the same values and the same goals for my own sake of not tempting myself. If your finish line is to abstain from drugs, run without the hurdle of having them readily available. For me, I don't surround myself with people who are doing drugs while they're high. I don't want that reality hit, and I don't want that temptation. It's kind of like being on a diet and being surrounded by big pieces of cake. Because more often than not, I'll fall into that trap because I put myself into that situation of inclination. If your finish line is to abstain from profanity, run without the hurdle of surrounding yourself with bad words. For me, I can't watch R-rated movies because I don't want to hear the bad words. I can't listen to a lot of rap music because I don't want to hear the bad words. And this may sound really immature to a lot of people, but my choice in what I listen to and what I watch is how I stay resensitized to the harms of profanity. Because I know that if I listened to them on a ba daily basis, and if I heard bad words constantly, that I would simply be setting myself up for failure to start thinking them, and then to start saying them, and then to start habitually acting on them. So steps one, two, and three for me are preventative. But what if you feel as if you've already given in to something that you don't suspect is good for you? 
Let's move on to step four, which is to make the personal choice to stop participating in these activities. After all of this, you may disagree with me. You may think that violence is okay. You may think that premarital and casual sex is okay. You may think that certain drugs are okay. Many people think that profanity is okay. That's okay. Because in the end, the choice is ours and the choice is yours. But what does this mean for you? Is there some small part of you that feels as if you're not living the best life that you can live? If there is, I encourage you to stop settling and stop participating. And you can do this in a variety of ways. You can put on tunnel vision glasses. You can be honest with yourself. You can keep your eye on the finish line. You can remove hurdles in your race. Or in a more practical sense, you can find an accountability partner. When I would face struggles with abstaining from each of these aspects of my life, I would turn to someone I trusted. I have a friend who keeps me accountable when I can't do it myself. Because when I would give in to a temptation, my friend would question my intentions and question not whether or not these intentions were worth ruining my race for and giving me and keeping me from my goals. Step five is to spread the word. I'm not saying that we need to judge every single drug user we know or every single person that might let a bad word slip once in a while. Instead, we need to share the importance of resensitization in our own lives. Because the truth is many societal norms that we have accepted are destructive. By spreading the word, we can change this. I'm not saying that every single person is going to stop engaging in premarital sex and doing drugs. Violent video games and violent movies will still likely be produced. People will likely still cuss as well. I'm just saying that by spreading the word, we can change what is considered normal in our society. Because maybe if we change what was considered normal in our society, video game industries and movie industries would stop promoting violent ones, but promote fun and lighthearted ones instead. Maybe if we change what was considered normal in our society, mass media industries would stop promoting sex on our screens and the pornography industry would decrease completely. Maybe if we change the norm, music industries would stop promoting profanity in the music that they sell. Maybe if we change what was considered normal in our society, people wouldn't be doing drugs to fit in, but rather they would be the outliers. Maybe. Because with the norm as it is, we continue to fund the desensitization that exists within our society. Because the truth is, I wish it wasn't normal to see an act of violence on the news every single day. I wish it wasn't normal for people my age to smash. I wish it wasn't normal for my classmates to know drug dealers by name. I wish it wasn't normal for the effort to be a part of our everyday vocabulary, but it is. This is our normal. And if we stay silent and compliant, it will only get worse. There was an experiment once with a young boy named Albert. And Albert loved these white rats. But the experiment was that every single time Albert saw one of these white rats, the experimenters would bang a hammer against a piece of metal, making this awful noise. Soon, Albert didn't love these rats because he associated them with this horrible noise. He was conditioned against them. In the same vein, we can bang the hammer every single time we see a sexual scene. We can bang the hammer every single time we see a violent act. Every single time we hear a bad word. Every single time we overhear a drug trade. We don't have to participate in these activities, but rather we can become resensitized against them. I'll finish by asking you not to be the person who looked at these two lines and said that they weren't exactly the same. Don't be the person who knew the right answer but submitted the wrong one instead due to social pressure. Because the truth is choosing line A and choosing line C is settling. Choosing to participate in these activities is settling. I'm not saying that your life will be ruined if you make this choice. I'm just saying that by making this choice, you're choosing to live a life that is less than your best. Thank you.